How many of you, raise your hand if you chant Japa every day. Good. Raise your hand if you don't, but you want to. Not good. <laughs> hmm. You know, when you do kirtan, you feel some, because we're singing, we feel some ecstasy. We feel some emotion, we put our hands in the air. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, you're like, oh Krishna, you know, just, you feel that when you're doing kirtan? Like you're praying and mercy's coming down. Sometimes you're singing naturally, your heart opens when you sing. Naturally, when you sing, you feel, feel you're calling out to Krishna for help. Hare Krishna, Hare, you know, we're just, we're calling out, isn't it? Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare, Hare. It's really coming from the heart, isn't it? I think what a lot of devotees don't realize is that those, those same emotions, uh, that's the same petitioning of prayer, that's how japa is meant to be. Exactly the same. But most devotees don't experience japa in the same way as they experience kirtan. And so many devotees will say, I like kirtan, but I don't like japa so much, or I don't like japa at all, but I like kirtan. Yes? So, it, japa, japa should not, the experience of japa should not be that much different than the experience of kirtan. And if the experience of japa is something which is difficult for you, then it means most likely you're not approaching japa in a proper way or a proper, with a proper understanding or a proper mood. And therefore, you're not feeling much. Um, or sometimes your feeling is that you just have to do this and you have to get it done because many of us take vows. Like some of us take vows at initiation, others will take vows just to, to chant a certain number of rounds. And so have you ever chanted? And basically your meditation was just how to get them done. Anyone ever have that experience? I'm just trying to get them done. It's not like a deep experience. It's kind of like if you have some service late at night and you're tired, you just want to get it done and go to sleep, right? I've got to clean the kitchen. Just let's get it done. I'm tired. So if, if that's the way we're doing japa, then I would say we should all understand I'm not doing it properly. If that's my experience, I'm not doing it properly. And I need to learn how to do it properly so that I would have similar experiences, at least similar feelings to what I have when I do kirtan. Prayer, uh, feeling some deep connection with Krishna. That's what japa is. So, We call chanting a process. In our scriptures, it says there are nine processes of devotional service. One is shravanam and one is kirtanam, and then there are other 
the other seven. We call them processes. That's a dangerous word. And I'm not saying it's not a process, but it's a dangerous word because actually it's a relationship. And if you call a relationship a process, that's a problem, right? So let's say I'm engaged to, well, let's say this is 50 years ago, and I'm engaged. And you ask me, so you have a, I heard you're engaged, you have a relationship with this woman. And I say, no, I have a process with her. <laughs> We're going through a process. You, wouldn't you think that was weird? Like, what do you mean? You don't have a relationship? You have a process? Yeah, I don't know anything about women and I'm getting counseling, you know, what to do. And it, it's not about the relationship, it's about the process. That's weird, isn't it? So we, we might think, we might think we don't have a relationship with Krishna because everything in our philosophy teaches that the relationship develops. So we don't have it, it's covered. And now I'm saying it's not a process, it's a relationship. I'm not saying it's a fully developed relationship or a fully manifested relationship. I'm saying it is a relationship. There's a difference, right? You know, like, like we all have a relationship with Krishna in one of the rasas. It's just not manifest, but the relationship is there. And so, although we do things which are processes, but what's the point of the process? And who is the process for? Point is a relationship, and it's, it is a, the process is in a relationship with Krishna. So, if you chant your rounds, and you think, I am doing a meditation process. Japa is a med like sometimes we'll preach and say, Japa is a meditation process. Right? It's, I think we need to say, Japa is a connection with Krishna. Japa is a relationship with Krishna. Japa is a prayer session with Krishna. Japa is an opening of the heart to Krishna. Japa is a begging Krishna for strength. That's what it's that's what it's meant to be. It's not, you know, you know, like I say, it is considered a process, but the problem is you can do a process without a relationship. Right? You can do a meditation process. Just do pranayama and meditate on your follow your breath. That's a process. And it's a meditation and it'll calm your mind down. Right? You just, you know, if you're angry or something, take some deep breaths, it'll calm you down. So I'm meditating on my breath and doing a process. Maybe I'm chanting home. Oh. Follow my breath, chant home. It's very process oriented. It's not relationship oriented. So we want to get away from process. And we want to enter. We want to see Japa as a connection with Krishna in a relationship through prayer. And I want to give an example of something that I was teaching this morning. I was in the uh, Bangalore this morning. And I was telling devotees that sometimes we want something, the mind wants it, there's a desire for something. But actually, we don't want it. But that desire is there. We think, I'd like to have this. But deep down inside, we know it's wrong. And we really don't want it, even though we do want it. And then we have 
desires for Krishna, we have desires for bhakti. I want to be a pure devotee. I want to love Krishna. I want to go back to Godhead. I want to be able to serve the mission. I want to be able to help other devotees. I want to purify my heart. This is the desire of a devotee. I want to purify my heart of Uh, that's what I want. So anyone who comes to bhakti has some of that desire. And as you stay in bhakti, that desire becomes stronger. So I have this desire. I want purity. I, I want to love Krishna. I want his desires to be my desires. I don't want a desire for myself. I want a desire for Krishna. We all have that. Somewhere in our hearts, we all have that desire. At the same time, we, we have desires that go against that. For example, so we all want to be humble. How many of you like to be honored? If you don't raise your hand, you didn't understand the question or you're deceiving yourself. Everyone should have their hand up. Everyone who wants to be humble also likes to be honored. Unless you're, you're a pure devotee, you love Krishna, you like to be honored. Even... Be humble, that's what, that's the desire, that's the pure desire that I have. But I really like it when I'm honored. And even if I tell you, I don't want to be honored, if you honor me, I'll li I like it. And how do you know I like it? I go, no, Prabhu, no, 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 I'm nothing. That's a sign that I like it. <laughs> you like it, you, you know, we like it so much, we're trying to pretend we don't. So this is the predicament that we are all in, that we want this, but we like that. And that is the opposite of this. I want to be this way, but I'm attracted to this. It's a problem, isn't it? We are conditioned souls. We are conditioned by this when the Shastra is directing us towards this. So I want to give you a little... Using this, I want to give you an idea of how we should see japa. If I want to be pure, if I want to have no desire independent of Krishna's desire, if I want to dedicate my life to Krishna, if the ultimate goal of my life is to love Krishna, and on this side, I have desires which are going against that. Then I think it's obvious when I'm chanting what I should be praying for. So I'll, I'll do a visual, right? This is where I want to be. So much of myself is here. I'm chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, can you bring this over to here? So that what my head wants, my heart wants, it only wants what's this side. I, I'm not this, I'm this. I'm, there's not two of me, there's one of me. Krishna, can you take all of this and bring it over to here? So that Whatever I know I should want, my heart, my mind, my words, everything will want it also. Don't you think we should pray for that when we chant? I mean, even when we don't chant, right? This is, this is the main problem we face. 
that what we want is not always what we want. And what we don't want is often what we do want. Yes? Should I say that again? What we want, pure bhakti, is not often what we want, because the conditioned side wants something else. And what we don't want, this side, is often what we want. It's a real predicament, isn't it? And so that's what it means to be a conditioned soul, that we're habituated to wanting things which go against our highest interest. And we're learning what we should want. But once we learn what we should want, it doesn't always mean that we want it. And we're also learning what we don't want, but just because we're learning what we don't want doesn't mean we don't want it. It's crazy, isn't it? So, so the challenge is to get from this side to this side. So what I want is what I want, and what is I don't want is what I don't want. What I want, I want. And so doesn't it make sense that when I'm chanting, I should that's what should be my goal, that what Krishna wants, what I know is pure, that's what I want also. Shouldn't I be praying for that? Seems to make sense, doesn't it? Oftentimes, we're chanting, and that consciousness is not there. And what, why are we chanting? As I said before, we're chanting to get our rounds done. Doesn't make sense, does it? Like, I'm supposed to be chanting to get my desires lined up with Krishna's desires. But I'm chanting. Why are you chanting? Oh, I'm just chanting. I'm supposed to chant, so I'm just chanting. You know that, that mood? I'm doing this because I'm supposed to. But, but my point is, what are you doing? You're certainly not supposed to be doing nothing while you're chanting and just having nothing in your heart. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. So, last night I was telling the devotees, if you chant for 50 years, and many of us will chant for more than 50 years, but if you chant for, let's say, 50 and a half years, you will have, by the, by the time you're 50 years from now, you will have chanted 300,000 rounds. So let's imagine those rounds are money. Every round is 100 rupees. So at the end of your life, you have you have three million, you have three million rupees worth of rounds, right? And one of the things that happens when you make progress in Krishna consciousness is that as you progress over time, you reap the benefits of all the service and sadhana and all the chanting you've done. And if you reap enough benefits, then at the end of your life, you'll be thinking of Krishna, right? It's like, you know, if you work hard, save money, invest it, then at the end of your life, you can retire, right? So let's say it's the end of our, it's, we're, we're gonna, going into retirement. And so, you know, we're preparing ourselves to go back to Godhead. And we go to the bank where we deposited all our japa rounds. And we figure, I have like 300,000 rounds worth of wealth in my account. I'm gonna to go to the bank and take it out so in my last days I can have the power of those holy names that I chanted. 
So you go to the bank and you say, I have deposited 300,000 rounds worth of rupees, 3 million rupees, and I want to take, take them out. And they come back and they give you 600 rupees worth of rounds. And you say, I deposited 300,000, you only give me 600. Well, it says here on the account that those 299,400 that you deposited were counterfeit. So out of the 300,000 rounds, there were only 600 good rounds that have any benefit and the rest are counterfeit. And now it's the end of your life and you're not re you can't reap the results of 16 rounds a day. I was, answer I was giving this analogy because someone was asking, isn't it a fact if you chant 16 rounds a day and follow the four principles, you'll go back to Godhead? I said, yeah, if they're not counterfeit rounds. So one of the things that's really important for us to understand is there is such a thing as counterfeit rounds. And so understanding that first thing that we really need to get is that just chanting a number is not sufficient. That's not the goal because obviously 16 counterfeit rounds, that's not what you want. It's not gonna help you. And when you go to check out at the end of your life, you, you don't wanna be surprised that your money's not there. So then this obviously presents the question, the question you should have is, well, what are proper rounds? And so as I was explaining, Proper rounds are rounds that are prayerful, that are intentional, that are trying to help us align our head and our heart. What, what, um, there's a beautiful, what are the deities' names? Sisirada Kunjibihari ki jai, Sisigorni tai ki jai, go permanent. There's a beautiful prayer by one of the Acharyas. And this is how he prays when he's chanting. He's praying, Krishna, please bring my heart closer to your heart. That's, that's what's going on inside of him. And that's what he wants. So he's addressing Krishna through the holy name. He's calling Krishna. And he's praying to Krishna that I want my heart to become closer to your heart. So let's try to understand that a little more deeply. Because if we, then we can really enter into what real japa is, what it really means. This is this. I want to explain what it means, and it's similar to Guru Mukha Padma Bhakya Chite Te Koriya Aikya, which we chant every morning. Please, we're praying to the Guru, please make my mind the same Aikya, one with your words. Guru Mukha, what you speak, Padma, Lotus, Bhakya. No. Guru Mukha, the mouth, Padma Bhakya, the lotus words coming from your mouth. Guru Mukha, Padma Bhakya, Chite Te, my consciousness, my mind, Chite Te, Koriya, make Aikya, Aikya, one. Right? So what does that mean? It means what you want, make it be what I want. Because the problem is we want what Krishna doesn't, sometimes we want what Krishna doesn't want. Sometimes we like to do things that Krishna doesn't want us to do. We like to do things that won't make him happy. In other words, we want to do what we want to do and we like what we like. But pure bhakti is, Krishna, bring my heart to your heart. And so if I bring my heart to your heart, 
then I will only want what you want. I will only desire what you want. I won't independently desire. So that's a beautiful prayer, isn't it? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And we're, we're begging, we're praying. Krishna, for so many lifetimes, I just desired what I wanted. And I've suffered in separation from you. And now, by some inconceivable fortune, I have the mercy of Srila Prabhupada and, and my gurus. And by their mercy, I've developed a desire to be Krishna conscious. And I want to be able to love you. That's what I want to do. I want to put your desire before mine. That's the desire of every devotee, isn't it? So don't you think when we're chanting japa, we should be feeling something like that? Don't you think that would be better than just having the feeling that I want to get my rounds done? Or being entirely focused on just pronouncing and hearing, but in the heart, there's nothing else other than trying to perfect the process. You've never heard this word process. Have you ever chanted trying to perfect the process? Like, I want to sit straight. I want to pronounce properly. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Hare Hare. And very straight. And you know, and you can also put your bead bag up here on the heart and sit straight and listen very carefully. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hari, 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 Ram, Hari, Ram, 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 Hari, Hari. So that's, the, that's a good way to do it. That's a good way to do the process. But for some of us, it doesn't go beyond that. It's just, I just have to pronounce it. I have to hear it. I have to sit properly. And I have to do 16 rounds, ideally in one sitting. And then I think if I do that, I've perfected the process. But maybe you have. But often, you can be doing that, but you, in your mind, you're thinking, the perfection of my japa is the perfection of the process. You know, it's like, when I do RT, I do so many circles to the feet, so many to the navel, so many to the head, and so many around the body. So, if I did RT in... You asked me, how was the RT? And I said, I did it perfectly. Like, what would you think? Does that mean he did the exact number of circles? And he did them perfectly, and he rang the bell perfectly, and he had a perfect doti, doti, perfect doti, perfect tilak. And if the devotee said, the RT was perfect, my tilak was perfect, my dhoti was perfect, the, the bell was perfect, the circles were perfect, wouldn't you think in your mind, that's only half of it? I think that would be natural. You probably think, he thinks he's perfected the RT just by doing the circles right and having, having a really nice dhoti and good tilak. That's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. And so often we focus on the process as everything, the externals as everything. That's a mistake. And, and when we do that, then we focus on, I have to chant, I have to hear, this is my number, this is how to pronounce it. And as I said, all those things are good, but it's only half of it. And it's the less, it's the half that's less important. Now, if you ever hear any kind of course on japa, you will inevitably hear that the focus is on hearing, right? There's chan in here, you know. Your mind wanders chan in here. But but it's actually only half. That's the external. This is what you do with your tongue. This is what you do with your ear. This is what you do with your body. 
sit in a sacred place where you won't be disturbed, chant and hear. But one time Prabhupada said, hear yourself chanting sincerely. Hear yourself chanting sincerely. That adds another dimension. It's not you only hear, but you're hearing yourself chanting sincerely. If you're hearing yourself chanting sincerely, what does that mean? What does it mean to chant sincerely? You sin sincerity means pure bhakti. Did you know that? That's Prabhupada's definition of sincerity is pure bhakti. Like anyabhi lashita shunyam. No motive. That's, that's sincere. If you're be sincere means I'm serving to please Krishna. I have no other motive. That's a sincere devotee. So Prabhupada's saying, hear yourself chanting. That's the process. Chanting how? Chanting sincerely. What does that mean? Chanting with the motive, with the desire for pure bhakti. So if you just do the external, you've only perfected the least important part of it. And you might say, well, you know, won't the mood and desire come if I hear and chant properly? It will, hopefully. But when that happens, it's difficult to say. And it's, it's not the recommended process. It may, it may seem to you, because you've heard it probably a lot, that that's how to chant, and that's like, that's just the only instruction. But if you, if you study the theology of the Holy Name given by Prabhupada and the Acharyas and how to practically execute japa, one thing that will come up again and again is it's a prayer. And prayers are all about feelings. And this is really interesting. When we pray, we're petitioning Krishna, we're asking him for something, right? So whenever you ask for something or anyone asks you for something, if they really want it, you will feel it. And if they don't really want it, they're faking it, you won't feel it, right? So if we're petitioning Krishna for something, do you think he can really feel what we want if we don't feel it? No, he can't. So even though words are coming out of your mouth, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, and you think I'm doing it, I'm chanting, what is Krishna feeling from your chanting? He's feeling what you're feeling. And if you're feeling nothing, that's what he's feeling. I mean, it's, it's common sense, isn't it? Like if you, if you feel nothing and you're talking to me, you'll just bore me. So, something really interesting that Bhakti Siddhanta Sharashati Thakur said. He said, you don't chant, you don't chant with your lips, which is kind of confusing, right? Well, if I don't chant with my lips, what am I chanting with? Because it looks like I'm chanting with my lips. I mean, how do you chant without your lips? He said, you don't chant with your lips, you chant with your heart. And then the heart will move the lips. If my lips say I love you, but you know I don't, it doesn't communicate. But if I don't, if I love you, I don't even have to say it. I just look at you and you feel it, right? So we don't chant with our lips, we chant with our heart. Isn't that beautiful? He said, it's not lip deep, it's heart deep. And it, the lips should be moving as a reflection of the heart's desire, not moving without heart. And how many times have we chanted and the lips are moving, but the heart is disengaged? Too many times, right? Even one mantra is too much. 
So what I'm what I like to do, what I try to do my best when I'm teaching about japa is give a picture to all of you of what proper japa looks like and give a picture of what improper japa looks like. Because some of us don't even realize what proper proper japa looks like. So you get a very clear picture that pro proper japa, it's a relationship. It's I'm petitioning, I'm asking Krishna for pure bhakti. That's what it's all about. It's coming from the heart because if it comes from the heart, it communicates to Krishna. He feels what we feel. What is Krishna feeling when you're chanting? He's feeling what you're feeling. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes we're chanting japa, and we say, I don't feel anything. We say, yeah, neither does Krishna. He can't feel you if you don't feel it. So his, his example was that you get the holy name from the spiritual, you get the holy name from the spiritual master, it enters your ear. And so there's, there's two possibilities. From your ear, it can go to your lips, or from your ear, it can go to your heart, and then to your lips. So you hear from the spiritual master. It's meant to enter the heart. From there I pray to the holy name. And then, uh, so the heart is, as we said, the heart is moving the lips. That's real chanting. Then hearing and going to the lips and bypassing the heart is missing the real, the deeper essence, the emotion, the connection. It's not lip deep, it's heart deep. He went on to explain other things, which are very important to understand, very important to be clear about. He basically was saying that not all chanting is the same. Some chanting is only a reflection of, of the holy name, and it's not even the holy name. It just sounds like the holy name. But if it's chanted with offense or it's not chanted properly, then he said Krishna is not present there. Now we know Prabhupada said Krishna is present in his holy name. And that's true, of course, but he's present in his holy name to those who are present to his holy name. He's present in his holy name to those who chant without offense. But if we're chanting with offense, if we're not present to him in his holy name, he's not present in his holy name, even though we're making the sound. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Would you like to hear a story? It's very instructive. There is, there is, um, maybe it's in the Harinam Chintamani or Jaiva Dharma. There's a, Bhaktivinoda Thakur talking about Nam Aparad, offenses to the holy name. And he was saying something really heavy. And he was saying, if you offend the holy name, you could chant 100 rounds a day and make no advancement. Like, so 100 counterfeit dollars, you're still poor. You, you've deposited 100 counterfeit dollars every day into the bank. You should have $3,000 at the end of the month and you go to the bank, you have nothing. That's, that's important to understand. So here's the story. This takes place maybe around 1974. There was a group of devotees living in a community together, and they had left Iskon. They had left Iskon to form their own community, but they were not strictly following the principles of Krishna consciousness. Thank you. 
So they were chanting, they were, they were chanting, but they were following two regulative principles. So there are four principles, no meat eating, no gambling, no illicit sex, and no intoxication. And they were following the first two, but not the last two. I never spoke to them. I don't know what they were thinking. But for some reason, they couldn't follow or they didn't want to follow. But they were doing kirtan. So the GBC went to see them and discussed with them. And he said, you know, this is not good. You're not following all the principles. And, he, and they said, but at least we're chanting. So this GBC went to Prabhupada and explained the situation. They're chanting, but they're only following two principles. But they say at least they're chanting. So it's better than nothing. And Prabhupada said, that chanting will not be effective for maybe 300 lifetimes. Like maybe in 300 lifetimes of Namaparad, something will happen. It's, in other words, he was saying, so then he went on to explain that. He said, if I'm disobeying obeying the order of my guru and I'm chanting, then it's Namaparad because one of the offenses is not to blaspheme the devotee, or no, excuse me, to disobey the order of the guru. That's one of the offenses, right? So they're chanting every day, they're disobeying the order of the guru, and the guru is saying, maybe in 300 lifetimes, something will happen. Wow, that's pretty scary, right? You want another scary one? I'm trying to scare you into chanting properly, because we're so inclined to chanting poorly that if I don't scare you, I don't know if you'll ever change. So I hope I scared you with the bank, that you could die with nothing in the bank, even though you chanted 16 rounds your entire life. So Bhakti Siddhanta said, the holy name is not present just by the mere recitation of syllables. Hare Krishna. You know, Prabhupada says Krishna is present in his name, but Bhakti Siddhanta, he's not denying that, but he's qualifying when is Krishna present in his name and when is he not present in his name? Well, obviously, if it takes 300 lifetimes before you can become Krishna conscious, but he was not in the names you were chanting. Right? So, Krishna's in his name. When is he in his name? Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, when you chant in the mood of service, like the mood of service means you chant in the mood, I'm a servant. I'm not trying to enjoy the holy name. I'm not trying to enjoy bhakti. Your whole bhav, your whole emotion when you're chanting is, I am your servant. I want to serve you. Help me, be, help me realize I'm a servant. That mood, he said. Then Krishna comes. He descends in the holy name. It's like a deity installation. You know, when you install the deity, you call the deity to come. So it's like that. He, Bhakti Siddhanta is saying, when you chant the holy name, he's not there. But when you call him to come through the mood of service, then he comes. So he said, Krishna is absent in the chanting of Namaparad. He's not there. Wow, that's scary. Krishna is not there in offensive chanting. We should be concerned, right? That we don't chant offensively. Have you ever chanted your rounds and felt exactly the same before and after? Yes? Yes or yes? Have you ever chanted one round that was so, by Krishna's mercy, was so good, he felt more purified than yesterday, 16? Yes or yes? Why is that? 
maybe Krishna wasn't in your names the day before, and maybe now today he is. And therefore, 16 Krishnas, 16 rounds of Krishna that is not in his name is not as good as one round of Krishna in his name. 16 counterfeit dollars is not as good as one real dollar. That's the idea. So if, if what we can get tonight is a few things, and then we can apply them tomorrow, it'll, you'll see that you'll, it'll make a difference tomorrow. So really, really try to remember this point. It's not lip deep, it's heart deep. It, it, the holy name comes from the heart and it moves the lips. If I say, as I, as I said before, if I say I love you and I actually love you, you feel it. If I say I love you and I don't, it's only lip deep. There's nothing in the heart. And bhakti is all about one's emotion, feeling, love towards Krishna. You know the verse Patra Pushman Palamtoyam, Krishna says, I accept a fruit, leaf, flower, or water offered with love. What if I like to, I was going to, the next time I see Krishna, I was going to ask him if he could add, Patra Pushpam Palam Toyom Nama, add Nama. If one offers me a fruit, flower, leaf, water, or the holy name with love, I will accept it. Isn't that beautiful? Like, why should we think that it doesn't apply to the holy name? It perfectly applies to the holy name, doesn't it? It's an offering, and we're offering Krishna his name with love, hopefully. But if we just offer his name just to get it done, here, Krishna, take this boga, I'm hungry. You know? So you're, you're chanting the Ma'om Vishnu Padaya, but in your heart, you know, Krishna, I'm hungry. I have to offer you know, like I have to offer this. My guru told me I have to, but I just want to eat. And that's what's going on in your heart while you're making the offering. And Krishna's not going to accept that offering to what you need to be pure and open your heart through the job chanting of the holy names and that's the proper way to do so um what's the schedule tonight try to finish by nine. Yeah. So i think that's a good introduction and i think with this introduction, your japa should be better tomorrow and We'll take time for questions, but just to finish up this section, try to think about what we talked tomorrow morning. Try to think about what we talked about tonight, especially the practical things. Before you begin chanting, try to think about what we talked about and try to apply it and see what happens. And if you apply it well, you'll see, oh, this is what chanting is supposed to be. It's an act of devotion, a personal relationship with Krishna. Not something I'm just trying to get out of the way because I'm busy. Okay. So if any of you have questions, we have a wireless mic or something. I think so. Jai, Haribo. Thank you for uh, the insight about the thought. Uh, we don't th think about like this. We try to finish our rounds um, because we have to. <laughs> uh, so I had one question. Sometimes we are able to chant with prayers, but that capacity of chanting with prayers is not that much because we have to chant for two hours. Maybe four, three, four mantras, maybe five mantras, maybe sometime. Right, yeah. The okay. capacity is not there that much. So because yeah. 60 rounds to be prayer, prayerful, it is, uh, I don't know. How it I have another way of looking at it. Well, I'll give you an example of how I look at it. So imagine Krishna every morning comes, comes to you, comes to your room. 
and it's just you and him in the room. And every morning he comes to you and he says, what do you want? And you say, well, I want to be pure. I want to be humble, this and that. And three minutes, after three minutes, you're like finished. Now, while you're asking him, the reason you shouldn't get tired is you have to convince him to give that to you, right? So let's look at the third verse. Let's try to understand the answer to your question to the third verse of Shishastakam. You know the third verse ends with the word sada, kirtaniya sada hari which means kirtan, sada, always, of hari. One can chant continuously. That's interesting. So you're asking Krishna for something you need help with, right? Whatever that is. It's probably something, it's probably some difficulty you're facing that is a huge problem in your relationship with Krishna. And you would like him to remove that. And it's very important to you. Because you understand this obstacle is ruining my relationship with Krishna, right? And this obstacle, it's always there. So if the obstacle is always there and this obstacle is ruining my relationship with Krishna, and Krishna has helped me in the past overcome this. And I really need help with it. Why would I only ask for two minutes? Because I know two minutes is not enough. I know 16 rounds is not enough. Krishna, please help me. We don't stop there. This is a big problem. I, I'm trying to overcome, overcome something that I've never been able to overcome before. Krishna, I want you to help me. I've done this before. It's really interesting. Before you sit down to chant japa, you, you do this kind of meditation. You ask Krishna for things that you need. And when I've done that, I realize that just asking once or twice or three times, it leaves me very insecure because Krishna, now that I have you here, I want to like keep asking you to make sure you give it to me. So I have to keep chanting because I have to keep asking because I want to make sure he's going to give it. And I want to, and I want to make sure that he knows I want it. Because I'm asking, you know, I'm asking him many times. You want your little kid wants something, he asks a lot, right? I'm asking many times. I'm showing Krishna. I really want it. And I don't feel like stopping because this what what I'm asking Krishna to help me with, it's so big. I know I'm gonna need help every day. And so here's the, here's the secret. That was the first half of the answer. And here's the secret. The reason you may not be able to stay in that prayerful mood is because what you're praying for may not be that important for you emotionally. Like you may not be feeling it. So think of something that you need in bhakti that you naturally feel strongly about. It could be a service, it could be developing a quality. It could be wanting to reciprocate with Krishna's mercy. Think of something that's like really important to you that if you could, like if you could get rid of that problem pretty much your life would be amazing. You wouldn't have any problems. And so you can understand when you're praying to Krishna to rid yourself of something on that level, 
then you don't want to stop asking until you're sure that you've conquered it. So you're always asking. Krishna, please help me with this. This is such a problem. Please help me. Please. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. I know how far I am from Krishna. I'm so far. And because I'm so far, how could I stop chanting? I just, I need to keep chanting all the time. I need his mercy. That's the idea. I'm a little sleepy. Did that make sense? Sometimes when I'm sleepy, I don't know if I'm making sense or not. Does it make sense or should I try to explain it again? It's my personal experience. I've, I've done japa exercises with devotees and we did this exercise. Like what is, you know, what would you ask Krishna for? What's important? And then you isolate, you, devotees will tend to isolate their biggest challenges and pray to Krishna to overcome those challenges. And so I was chanting, praying to Krishna to help me overcome a challenge. And I realized I'm going to have to be chanting a lot to overcome this. This is like a big thing. And, and when it was time to stop the, ch the chanting, I didn't want to stop because I felt like I need to keep asking. You know, I just, I need to be sure Krishna is going to reciprocate with me, so I need to keep asking. I just, I didn't want to stop chanting because I, I didn't yet feel like Krishna was giving what I asked. So the problem with the lack of focus is that what you're asking for or praying for may have real no relevance to you. It might just be like a, you know, a stock answer type thing. Well, this is what you should pray for. But if you are praying to the Holy Name for something that is so relevant to you right now, there's going to be a lot of emotion there. Like you want to overcome a problem and it's a really big problem and there's a lot of emotion connection connected to that problem. And if you, if you could imagine what it would be like to be without that problem, you could chant a lot. Because I'm just going to keep chanting till I feel like I'm conquering this problem. Yes. Um, like Shri Rupa Goswami Pad in a nectar of devotion, he says six symptoms of uh, pure devotional service. So one of the symptoms is uh, it's on a platform prema that is called Sudurlava. Very rarely given to the devotion is given to very rare, rarely. Given. So when we hear this, so when we are asking uh, devotional service to Krishna, so I know that I'm not going to get so easily. So that's why my that intensity is not there because. I'm not going to get so far if immediately because unless I'm going to get pure. Another yeah, going to get well, pure. if you're if you're not intentive, intentional about it and strong, you're definitely not going to get it in this life. Whereas if you keep going, you you have you really have no option other than praying to Krishna to help you. And it's not it the weight is not entirely on us. The weight isn't on us for the execution of our sadhana, but not for the result. That result, that's Krishna's. So you, you may think you can't get it, but it doesn't mean you can't, because he can do it. I think the most important thing is to desire without considering whether you think you can achieve it, but if you have a desire to serve Krishna in a certain way, Go for it. That will cause you to chant better rounds because it's more difficult. Is that all right? Or, yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Thank you for a uh, wonderful Japa oh, session. You're welcome. Uh, so, Prabhu, my question is that, uh, uh, like Bhakti Nath Thakur Mahasaya also said in uh, Harinam Chintamani, that uh, uh, without uh, reaching on the stage of Shuddha Nam, one will not get Krishna Prem. Even if, uh, even though he is chanting the Niraparad Nam, that is Nama Bhaste. So, my question is, uh, as you also said, that one should uh, chant in a mood of uh, love, devotion, feeling. 
so how can we develop that first question is this and how can we develop the naam ruchi and second question is that bro uh, that uh, as you also said that even if the person is chanting uh, uh, rounds for 300 words he will not uh, get krishna that also i had read in the chaitanya charitamrita that bahu janma kariya the shavana kirtana tab tu na pai krishna pad prem dana and also it is said in the chaitanya charitamrita again that ek krishna naam kare sarva papa shay nav vidha bhakti purna naam that's sin papa so that's not love okay then uh, that is uh, for sin sin so okay. different different than love okay anyone chants hare krishna or oh, your sins are gone Okay, no problem. But love is a different thing. And your first question, I forgot. So, how to develop uh, that? Uh, yeah. So here's here's what I think is really important, and it will make it easy to apply this. If you look at your life, and you look at what you need in your spiritual life, and you think. If Krishna were to come to to me and ask me, I'll give you anything. What do you want? You ask yourself, what would you ask for? I mean, you can. And Krishna said, you can ask for anything. You know, not just one. Like, ask. What would you know? So you think, what would I ask for? I think some of us, maybe, we are so. We've suffered so much in the material world. We might just say, "Please stop my suffering," or we've suffered so much in, in the hands of Maya. We might say, "Please remove Maya from my heart," or we've suffered so much because our devotion isn't pure. Please make me a pure devotee. What, whatever you should think. What would I ask Krishna for? Like, what is like? Do I really want? And what do I really not want? And what would I really want Krishna's help for? And so, so let's say we'll hypothetically pick something. You say, okay, what? What I really want is I want to, like I say, I want to be a person who lives in integrity. Let, let's say, like whatever. Is the ideal of Krishna consciousness? I want to be that person who lives that ideal as best they can, at least tries to live that ideal. And let's say for you, that's the most important thing in Krishna consciousness for you. So it's not artificial for you. That's how you feel. You don't have to create the feeling because that's how you feel. So why not bring that feeling into your japa because you already have it? So you don't have to create it. It's so I find is that if your japa reflects what is natural already to you, then it's it's so easy to chant. So if you all think of what's important for you. And bring that, bring that into your japa, because you already feel that way. So the emotion is going to be doesn't have to be aroused. The emotion is already there, right? Does that make sense to you? Like, let, let's say, for example, everyone who everyone who becomes a devotee, obviously, to be a devotee, you have to. You have to have some realization of the limitations of material life and material happiness and so forth. If not, outright frustration with it. And we all struggle with Maya, and it would really be nice if Maya left us alone, don't you think? And it really would be nice if we just had pure bhakti. So to me, like chanting in that mood, Maya, stay away. I want to love Krishna. 
I don't want to love you. I'm suffering in this world. I don't want Maya. And then I chant in that mood. That's what the Maha Mantra means. I want to serve you. I don't want to deal with your material energy anymore. So if you, if you feel that, and I think most of us feel that, then why don't we chant in that mood, Krishna, I want to serve you. I don't want to serve Maya. I'm sick of serving Maya. I just want to serve you purely. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And then you connect with that feeling. You can't lose that feeling because it's a permanent feeling. As opposed to you trying to create a mood and chanting and then you lose it in five minutes. But go deeper to something that's more real. That's something you feel all the time. Then you can't lose that feeling. Because you just have to be a conscious or aware of that feeling. But that's how you normally feel. Krishna, I want to serve you. I don't want to serve Maya. We all normally feel like that. Don't we? So in one sense, like put bringing emotion into chanting, if we're bringing in the emotion we already feel, that is like a complete hack. You know, it's this, the way to hack this whole, whole system of emotional chanting is just, well, I already feel this way. Just add the Maha Mantra. I remember many times I've been distributing books and I really, really wanted to do a certain number of books. And I would pray very deeply and very intensely for a long time because I really wanted to achieve this. Does that make sense? And it can be anything. Any form of maya you're afraid of, whatever it might be. Something you want to give up. Something you need to do. Please help me. But it should be something that has emotional energy for you. So like you feel this strongly. So when you chant, you have to feel it because you always feel it. Have you ever felt like, you know, someday you just feel like, really be nice to go back to Godhead like in the next five minutes. You ever had, had that feeling? You know, that borders, kind of borders suicide a bit, you know, but I'm not saying, it sounds like suicide. It's not. It's just like some, sometimes we just feel like, Krishna, just pick me up out of this world. This is horrible. and I just want to get out of here, right? And then we chant our rounds, and they're really good rounds, and they're really focused and intense because that day we were just feeling like. And so your rounds are good, your mind's fixed, everything's happening because that's how you feel. Is that okay? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. You're welcome. Uh, Maharaj, as you described that uh, if one chants millions of millions names, still he is not able to go back home, back to God, right? But at the same time, Brahma Purana Maybe is... Someday, someday. Means? Someday he'll be eligible. Uh -huh, right. But still, uh, uh, and you also said that... Uh, that Krishna is not present uh, in that name, which is not calling him uh, intentionally, right? But still, Brahma Puran described that Api Anna Chitto Shuddhova Ye Kirtayan Sada Hari. Still, he got liberated. That is Brahma Puran described. So, who are we talking about? A Jamil? Who are we talking about? A Jamil? What's that verse relating to? No, no. Uh, that verse is so. Just... You read the translation. Brahma Puran describes that Api Anne Chitto Shutova, Ye Sada Kirtayan Harin, Sopi Doksha Shaya Muktin, Labet Chedi Patiata. If one chant unconsciously, Matlab, uh, means uh, uh, as we know that uh, constantly things come in our mind while chanting, but mm -hmm. still, if, if he chants continuously, then he'll got liberated. 
So show me the verse that says you can commit offenses to the name and get love of Krishna. There isn't one. There's a lot of verses saying you can get liberated, but you, know, you want to go to Brahman or just become free from sin? I don't think so. So Shudhanam gives you love, and it's only love that can get us to Krishna. You know, obviously, we're not going to stop chanting. We're going to try to do our best. But there's so much bad chanting going on in our movement. And if I don't, like, exaggerate the other side and just say, look, at this chanting is useless. Of course, you'll find verses like this and say, it's not completely useless. But at the same time, we see many devotees are chanting and they have lots of trouble in their spiritual life. So in a sense, their chanting is useless because it's not really helping them because they're making offenses. So, if, you know, I think, I think the problem is we read these verses that says Krishna is in his holy name and just chant and if you make offenses, just keep chanting. And it kind of misguides us. So we think, look at what these verses say. You know, I don't have to chant well. I'll just chant. And Prabhupada says, just keep chanting. So I just chant. I'm chanting. You know? So I want to make the point is you're chanting, but you're not really chanting. It's not the way it's meant to be done. And if you don't do it the way it's meant to be done, you're not going to get a good result. And you're going to have difficulty in your spiritual life. And if you're having difficulty in your spiritual life, there's a good chance that you're not chanting properly. And if you're doing very well in your spiritual life, there's a good chance you're chanting properly. And again, when we're chanting, it, it's an opportunity to beg Krishna to pray, please help me with something, whatever it is you need help with. And so what is, you know, Krishna comes to your house, he comes in your room, you sit down together, and he says, what do you want? And you say, I don't know. I, I can just, you know, whatever. So sometimes that's how our chanting is. Krishna, you know, we're calling Krishna. Hare Krishna, he's coming, what do you want? And we're saying, um, nothing really. <laughs> just chanting. Just, can you help me get my rounds done? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't, isn't it? I mean, this is how most, this is how most devotees chant. Is it, isn't it? Yeah. And it's not the way we're supposed to do it. And I think part of the problem is we, when we're told just chant it here, then we think it's just a process. And so we just try to do the process. And if you just try to chant in here, most devotees can't. So then you're just distracted. So you just try to get your rounds done because you can't really control your mind because you're not putting any prayer or emotion into it. You're not, there's nothing, you don't feel anything. Like, you ever do a job that's boring? It's really hard to do it, isn't it? And you have to do it all day. It's really difficult. So if you're chanting job and you're just bored because there's nothing, there's no prayer, there's nothing in your heart, you know, even if you read that verse, you won't, but you won't be able to continue. It says continuously chant, but how can you continuously chant if you don't chant properly? You lose your taste. And when I was reading that continuously chant, that means there must be doing something right. Yes? Not everybody can do that. If you, if you want to improve your japa, you have to know what is good japa and what is bad japa. You know, like some, you ever, someone ever tell you, 
you're doing something and they say, don't do it like that. And you say, oh, I didn't know that. Is this the wrong way? He said, yeah, that's the wrong way. Oh, I always do it this way. I didn't know. Right? So my goal whenever I teach about japa is to show devotees, this is not japa. And this is japa. So if you've been doing this, this has to stop and it has to become this. And if you do this, then everything good will come from it and you'll like to chant. You'll relish it and you'll want to do it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, okay. So just understand, I'm exaggerating a little bit the other side because I think in ISKCON, we're on the we're on the weak side of it. Like, like I, on a scale of one to ten, because I've done this survey. On a, I've done this survey with, I think, three thousand devotees, or maybe more than that. On a scale of one to ten, with ten being excellent japa and one being bad japa, the Hare Krishna movement in general is at about four the quality of the average devotee's job is four, and five is in the middle, which is average. Four is below average. So four is bad. The average quality of japa in the Hare Krishna movement is basically bad. That's why I'm so heavy. It's like, you don't chant like this. This is not japa. This is japa. It's a connection, it's a prayer. It's a prayer, you know, to rid, rid ourselves of everything that goes against pure bhakti. And as I was saying before, you just have to connect your heart to the holy name in a way that's real for you. So then there'll be intensity and there'll be longevity. And if it's really important for you, it's not going to be difficult to keep chanting because, because you're praying to Krishna. You know, imagine this, you really get into it and you really feel that Krishna is hearing you. You think you'd want to stop chanting? It's like, I don't want to stop now because I want to make sure I've convinced Krishna. Okay, you have two hours to convince him to help you with something. And after you finish your 16 rounds, then you might feel like, I don't know if I've convinced Krishna yet. Maybe I need to chant more. I have that experience. I feel, have you ever had this experience that you chant 16 rounds and you think, that's nothing. That's, that was warm up, you know, now I'm warmed up. Let's play the game, you know. It's not enough. I have so many problems and I need so much help. 16 is like, that's really bad. You know, I need to chant more. That's the point we want to come to. And, and, and a lot of us are in, this, are in this mood of just get 16 done and everything's okay. Everything's okay if you actually chant 16 properly. Otherwise, no. Yes. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, thank you very much for a wonderful uh, session on Holy Name. So my question was, I find in my practice that uh, certain times uh, after a chanting session or after chanting certain rounds, I find certain anarthas coming up in my heart. Yeah. Uh, at other times, I find myself quite peaceful. So what I should understand as a proper thing and what is not proper? You should understand that when the anarthas come up, your rounds were better than the day that they didn't come up. That, that could be the understanding. You're thinking the opposite, right? Yeah. No, it might be that that was the good day. That's why they came up. Um, I mean, it's the process. It's purifying us, so it's going to come up. And what's interesting about anarthas coming up is that we get discouraged when they come up, but as you said, they're coming up. That means they were down and they're coming up. So it's not like they came from nowhere and it's like, oh my God, the chanting of Hare Krishna produces anarthas. 
No, it causes the anarthas to rise into your awareness. Now you, you, di you didn't know you had them, or you didn't know to the degree that you had them. Now you're chanting, you're becoming purified, so you realize you have them, right? So they're coming up from being buried. So that's good. So just one more question in this regard. So certain times uh, devotees say, for example, we go for chanting extra rounds, for example, 64 rounds on Ekadeshi or certain days or more. So we shouldn't, we should always chant in association of devotees. If you were alone traveling, so what is a proper practice in that regard? Should we chant more rounds uh, or if we are alone or traveling because or we should read more what is proper because again there that chance of anatta is coming up yeah maybe there um, you can chat good rounds anywhere anytime alone in the dom outside the dom it's just easier to do it in the right environment so if you want to chat good rounds and you're not in a good environment you're gonna to have to try harder and you know it's like just take a get on a train or a plane to Vrindavan. You don't have to try very hard to chant good rounds. You know, every other person is telling you Jai Rate, and the dust is emanating prema. So it's like it's a pretty easy place to chant. But you know, you're working in a city, you're on the bus, this and that. You have to try much harder, but you can do it. I it just it's not. Don't give up. Don't think. Well, in this situation, I can't. You can, but you'll have to deal with it more strategically because it's going to be harder. But if you think, if you ever think, I can only chant good rounds in one environment and not another, then you predispose yourself to fail in your japa in every other environment than the one that you think you can chant well in. So it's a little dangerous. I can't chant good rounds at night. I can't chant good rounds if I'm alone. I can't, well, if you think that way, that's what's going to happen. But if those are realities that you have to live with, then I would, I would think, how can I chant good rounds in that situation? Oh, that's good. That would be my meditation. Is that all right? Kunji Bihari ki jai, Kuni Tai ki jai. Radhe, Radhe. Is that it? Does that mean party's over or party's just starting? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, one more question. Like uh, after completing 16 rounds uh, while doing some seva, uh, like prasadam or something like that, we should uh, unconsciously we chant. That should be chant or should we didn't chant? Uh -huh. Well, we should always chant, obviously, but something to be aware of. If you're, just, if you're just working and you're chanting and it's nice, you know, that's a sign, that's a good sign of your Krishna consciousness. But something to be aware of is if you're chanting kind of, you're doing your service, so your service is what you're focusing on, and your chanting is unconscious and distracted. Just notice if the next day your chanting is unconscious and distracted. And it's possible it will be, because that's how you did it yesterday. And so how we chant today tends to feed into how we chant tomorrow. So just be careful. Anything else? Yes. Can we bring her a microphone? Oh. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, ever, uh, it has become very difficult to focus on chanting 
uh, especially with the baby and everything. So uh, does Krishna give any concession in that case or what? <laughs> well, I can quote Giriroshami when he was asked this question. He wasn't asked if the women get special concession. He was just asked that, that I have a child and I can't chant with focus and I can't even finish my rounds. And he said, the mothers get special concession. That was his answer. So, you know, Krishna knows everything that's going on in our hearts. So he, he knows that you're trying. And trying is, re is really what's most important. And you, don't, you can't neglect your children. And sometimes you neglect your japa for your children. And it's not ideal, but sometimes it's a reality. And Krishna knows that. And Krishna understands that. And Krishna definitely understands you're going to be distracted when you chant as you are now. Yeah. That's the nature of having kids. So, yeah. You could say mothers get special mercy. That would be nice. Just do your best. Is that a boy? Girl. She'll grow up, don't worry. Just keep feeding her. And one day she'll go to school and you'll say, Phew. and then you can chant those 7,864 rounds you have to make up. Yes. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Um, I got the idea of environment chanting and not to depend on certain environment you're comfortable. So I have tried chanting with um, Kirtan, like the way you said, some people like Kirtan, some people are comfortable with chanting. So is it an offense? Because when I've chanted with Kirtan, I feel more connected and I feel more uplifted. Probably it must be the music or yeah, you know, something like that. So. It would be better if you were more uplifted from your own, from what you produce in your own heart, without depending on something. Because music affects emotion for sure, but it's the music that's creating the emotion. It's not us generating the emotion. And proper chanting is really that we generate the emotion rather than something else. And Prabhupada said. Either chant japa or do kirtan, don't do both. But there's a way, out, there's a way around this. Because in Mayapur, when I was there in 1975, Prabhupada had a tabla player and one or two Shanai players. And they would play. Have you ever heard that recording? There's a recording of Shanai and tabla. You might find it on Iskand Desire Tree or somewhere. And Prabhupada said it created an auspicious atmosphere. Yeah, it was like a it was like a, a rock for that time, and he said it created an auspicious atmosphere. So that seems to be like Prabhupada seemed to be okay with that to create like a sattvic mood. But he said, you know, either do japa or do kirtan because they're, they're two different things. And I, I honestly feel that our inspiration really needs to come from within us rather than create something that gives it. You know, you could go a, a nice walk in the park, it'll be inspiring and help your japa. And it's nice, but really, ultimately, we should be generating these feelings for Krishna through our chanting. That's the best. That's what the way it's supposed to be. So Krishna comes to your house, and Krishna says, "You can chant to me. I'll just be here, you know, in front of you." 
and you say, okay, can I put on a kirtan to get in the mood? Yeah, that would be, that wouldn't be, Krishna's there. The object of your love is there. Why would you need anything else? So Krishna's in his name. So that, that would be the ideal thing. And if, if that doesn't work for you, then not, it should be something other than kirtan. Or, or like, listen to kirtan and then stop and then chant. Like, get in the mood. Okay, I feel this mood. That kirtan always puts me in this mood. I just feel a lot of bhakti, a lot of bhav, and then Hare Krishna didn't go into Japan. That could help. I always tell devotees that if you want to be in the right mood for japa, before you begin chanting, try to create that mood. Like, like feel. What do you want to feel when you chant japa? What's, whatever that is. Then before you start chanting, get into that feeling and then start chanting. So try that. So you can try to get into that mood however you need to and then turn off the recording and see if that works and then try to carry that mood. See what happens. I'll be here tomorrow. What's the next session? Are we doing another session when? Tomorrow, Bhagavatam class. So we can continue japa. Yeah. So let's do that tomorrow morning. We'll do more about japa. So we'll continue this discussion. And um, what I would request you to do today is go over, you know, what we've discussed, what is important. And tomorrow, I'll try to apply it in your japa and see what happens. See if it helps. Because everything I'm saying, it needs to be practiced. We can start tomorrow, you know, really try to put it into practice and see. And then we'll talk about it tomorrow morning. So tomorrow evening also we have 7.30. Oh, you have 7.30 tomorrow evening. Oh, in that case, we'll see. You have a nice verse. I could maybe tie in the verse to the japa tomorrow. So, all right, tomorrow morning at 7.30 and then tomorrow evening at 7.30. 7.30 and tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. Oh, 8 o'clock tomorrow morning and then in the evening at 7.30. Okay, so we'll see you then. Thank you very much. And if we have some books on Japa in English and Hindi in the back, if you're interested in other books, and like say, I can sign, if I can Hare Krishna, Mahara stay awake. <laughs> Maharaj's books here, he has written nice aphorism also on Japa book. So we can take the help of that and increase our mood in chanting. So those who want to take the book and then Maharaj also will sign the book. Hare Krishna. We want to thank uh, His Grace Mahatma Prabhu by ch chanting one time Hare Krishna, one time with my heart. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare Hare. His great Mahasma Prabhu ki jaya. Hare Krishna, sabke liye prasad hai. Hare Krishna. Jho pehle kupan unke paas sabke liye prasad hai, uske baad baaki sabke liye hoga.